Hello there guys, thanks for joining me and welcome to Civilization 5. This is a bit of a strange one for the channel. I know you've seen me playing Civ 5 before in the background of uh, one or two rambling videos. This isn't really so much a series, I just decided I was going to play a bit of Civ 5 and I thought I'd invite you guys along to join me. This sort of thing is probably the kind of video that most people would stream but I don't really do streaming and the kind of times I play games, most of my audience are either asleep or are at school or work. So I thought I'll just record this game as I go along and split it up into bits and pieces and pop it onto YouTube. My thoughts for this game are, it's going to be part let's play. I'm just playing to have fun. I'm going to play a game and at the same time, I'm going to try and stick to my kind of usual method of trying to be informative and give a little bit of a tutorial. Now I'm by no means an expert at this game and I don't claim to be but I do know the game fairly well. Um, I can play it to a reasonable level. I know the mechanics and the rules of the game very well so I can't promise I'm going to win but hopefully to uh, you guys who are interested in playing the game or new to the game and not 100% sure how it works as useful as the in-game tutorials are and the manual itself it doesn't always explain everything and i think civ 5 is very much like chess it's easy to learn the rules and learn how the pieces move and how to play the game but to master the game and be able to actually play it properly and win is a little more difficult that said this could end up being a complete disaster and i might end up losing so i'm going to set up a game now normally when you set up a game you get these uh, sort of standard options where you can pick your leader, pick the map type, the map size, the difficulty and the game pace. Or we can go into advanced setup. We could randomise all of this. But I'm going to show you guys what you've got in advanced setup anyway. So you see the list of uh, players. So in this case there are going to be eight civilizations, and this is based on the map size. So depending on the size of the map you pick is the number of civs that you're going to get. Obviously I'm going to be the only human player here and all the rest are going to be played by the AI. I could pick specific civilizations if I wanted, but it's more fun sometimes to random it up. You can actually lock teams and put different players on the same team and then their score becomes cumulative and they share things like science. Probably not something you ever really want to mess with until you get used to the game. So let's have a look what we've got. Now, city-states. City-states do play a very important part of the game. Um, they are, uh, well, like the name states, they are single cities. Uh, they're not civilizations. They only have one city. They can't really expand, and they're very limited in what they can do. But they do populate the map. You can trade with them, and they also give you additional votes in the Senate. Uh, they sometimes provide additional troops to you depending on the type of city-state they are. So they are very important to the game. Now I'm playing Brave New World, which is the latest expansion. So everything that you're going to see and hear me talk about will be based on Brave New World. You've got a lot of map types you can actually choose from because it includes all of the maps from the single-player scenarios as well. Now some of the maps give you more options. If we click Hemispheres, for example, you'll see this will actually expand here. Some of the things on here are relatively sort of standard. So for example, you can pick the map size uh, and it tells you as you'll hover over each one. A jewel is a two player map with four city states, four players with eight city states. Standard map is eight players with 16 city states. And you can go all the way up to huge 12 players, which is the max with 24 city states. You can actually adjust the number of city-states if you wish to and you can also delete civilizations so you can have less people playing. Difficulty level, there are nine difficulty levels in the game of Civilization 5. Prince is considered normal difficulty and the way this works is changing the difficulty level doesn't really change the um, the AI. It doesn't really change the way the AI works except it becomes a little bit more aggressive at uh, higher levels but um, the way this actually works is if you play on Prince everything is pretty much at a hundred percent all of the resources you get all of the bonuses you get for happiness the amount of culture points you need to adapt social policies are at a hundred percent 
If you play on easier difficulties, you actually get given um, extra bonuses. So you will gain extra happiness uh, from things that give you happiness. You will gain additional resources from things that give you resources. Uh, things will cost less. As you go up through the high difficulties, it becomes harder because you will actually uh, receive a handicap, you will get less happiness from things that give happiness, and it also gives a boost to the AI players as well. So it doesn't really make the game more difficult by making the AI more intelligent or better, it just does it by fiddling with the balance numbers essentially. But we're going to play on Prince. It should be noted that normally, if you're playing on Prince or below, the AI will always be playing on Chieftain, so they actually get a significant advantage. Um, game pace is just basically how long it takes to uh, research certain texts within the game. So if you put it on quick, you will be able to research things uh, a lot faster, they'll take less turns. And if you put it on epic or marathon, things take a lot longer. So basically, it's just the pace that the game runs at, it speaks for itself. Technology tree goes up through various eras. It's always more fun to start right at the beginning when you have literally nothing. You haven't even invented the wheel, but you can start later on if you wish. Personally, it's not something I enjoy doing. But these next um, sort of five here are what you get from certain maps. Uh, a lot of people don't fully know what these do. Uh, world age is basically how flat or mountainous the terrain is. So uh, an older world um, will be more flat and a um, younger world will be more mountainous so it usually goes to the middle one temperature cooler climates are more likely to have more ice bigger ice caps uh, less deserts um, hot is more likely to have more deserts and more rainforests rainfall uh, arid is more likely to have more deserts and uh, wet is going to have more marshes and again more uh, rainforests and jungles Resources, basically, do you want to have few resources or a lot of resources? Uh, the islands, how many tiny islands do you have, if any? And then team setting, whether this teams start together or start split up across the map. What I'm going to go for is a random map because, you know, I do like to have the potential for anything to happen. So what have we got here? We've got five victory types you can have, which you can en enable or disable any of them. Time, it's supposed to be five victory types. I kind of count this as four and a half. There's four proper victories, which is science, domination, cultural, and diplomatic. Time is essentially if you reach the year 2050, which is turn 500. If you get to turn 500 and haven't won by one of the four main victory types, it just goes by whoever's got the highest score. So it's kind of a stalemate, but you just win by... It's kind of like the judges in a boxing match, I suppose. If there's no knockout by the end of the allotted number of rounds, it goes on score, which is pretty much what time is. You've got these advanced op options here. Most of these you never need to uh, turn on and off. Max turns basically allows you to set a limit for the maximum number of turns if you want it quicker than 500. Um, policy and promotion saving. Basically, whenever you get a, uh, enough culture to start a social policy or whenever you get enough XP to promote a unit, you normally have to promote that unit or um, adopt that policy on that turn. You can't continue until you do. Clicking those allows you to... Um, save them and just spend them when you need them. Um, complete kills means uh, to eliminate someone from the game you have to destroy all of their units. Normally you only have to destroy all of their cities and then they're wiped out but complete kills means you have to uh, kill every single one of their units. By default, um, civilizations have a start bias, which means that civs will tend to spawn in areas that have the resources their particular civilizations need. And will, you know, if their civilization particularly thrives next to a river, they will usually start next to a river and that sort of stuff. Um, random seed basically means that each time the game is loaded in, it will um, re-roll the dice to determine what's going to happen in that turn. Normally, that doesn't happen. So, if you save the game, play a turn and then you reload the game and play the same turn, the turn will happen exactly the same way as it did before. Kind of like the way that um, XCOM Enemy Unknown works, if you watch my Let's Play on that. If you put it on New Random Seed, you could save the game, play a turn, reload the save, play the same turn, and it might turn out differently. That's what that means. 
Ancient ruins you can turn on or off, but they give you an early bonus in the game. You can also turn barbarians off, which are a little bit annoying, but they do give you some early money and XP. Um, city raising, you can also turn that off, which means cities can't be burnt down. Espionage basically means you can turn the spy system off. One city challenge is a really, really difficult thing because, and this only affects human players, you're only ever allowed to have one city. It doesn't really affect Venice all that much because Venice really only have one city, although they can buy city states. Um, quick combat and quick movement is just really to disable animations. Raging Barbarians makes the Barbarians much, much more aggressive and very difficult to deal with. And Random Personalities means that the Civilization leaders will um, have random personalities, essentially. So normally, certain Civilizations, their leaders act like you'd expect them to. So for example, um, if you were playing against India with Gandhi, Gandhi's very passive and very, very unlikely to ever declare war against you. But if you were to click random personalities, he could end up with the um, personality of Genghis Khan and become very, very aggressive. So what we're going to go for is keep everything uh, fairly standard. I am going to have a uh, larger map uh, well, map type, I'm going to go for random. I want to have a large map. Let's have 10 players with 20 city-states. Uh, I'm going to keep the difficulty level on Prince. I'm going to keep the game pace on Standard. And I think what I'm actually going to do is delete two of the AI players. So we're going to have... Um, let's get that down to 16. So what I'm doing here is I'm essentially playing with 8 civilizations and 16 city-states, which is what you'd have for a Standard map but I'm playing on a larger map. And I like to do that because I'd like more space to build. I don't like to start in somebody's pocket. So let's start the game and see who we're going to get. I have no idea what uh, civilization I'm getting. Eternal glory okay, praise. so I'm getting Boudicca and the Celtic Empire. And uh, we have Druidic Law, which is our civilization bonus. So we actually gain extra faith um, if we have a city with an unimproved forest. This isn't going to become that useful to us, unfortunately, later on, which isn't great. Um, we do have a unique unit in a unique building. Each civilization will start with um, either two unique units or one unique unit and a unique building. Our unique unit... Uh, what does it do? I can't remember this off the top of my head. Combat bonus outside of friendly territory. So it's very, very good early on for exploring. And um, you can pillage enemy improvements at no additional movement cost, which is great. And 50% of the opponent's strength as faith for kills. So the Celtic Empire is all about actually gaining additional faith. And um, the hall gives us additional culture and great music slots. So let us begin. And here, as you can see, we start with our settlers, and we also start with one unit of warriors. Now, you don't have to pop your first city down straight away on the very first turn. Yeah, it's always worth just having a quick look around. There might be a more suitable starting tile. Uh, in this case, there probably isn't. Where we've actually started is ideal. So let's pop the city down right there. Now, obviously, one of the things that you don't want to do is spend a long time walking your uh, settlers around to find a good place to start. Because the problem you're going to have with doing that is, one, you might get them captured by barbarians, and then you're basically stuffed because you haven't got any way of uh, haven't got any way of being able to build a city. Uh, and secondly, every turn that you don't have a city, the AI is essentially getting ahead of you. So. If you haven't played this game before, the map is split up into these individual tiles, also known as hexes. Um, all of the tiles that are within this blue circle here, obviously these colours change depending on the civilization you're playing. The tiles that are within this circle are within my borders, and I gain a certain amount of resources from each of these tiles. So, if I mouse over the lake, you can see it appears just here, uh, above the minimap. The lake gives me two food, if worked. It also appears on the tile if you leave the uh, mouse still long enough. Um, this is a resource. This is dyes. 
but this particular um, tile is a forest and plains tile, which will give me one food, one construction, and two gold if worked. Uh, we have furs here, but it's a forest and a plains, which will give me one food, one construction, and two gold if worked, and so on and so forth. You can improve these tiles. So if we take this tile here, which is a forest on a plain, it gives us one food and one production. We can get rid of the forest and it will just become a plain, uh, which will give us more production. And then we could also then upgrade that to a farm, which would give us more food. So that's something I'll cover as we go along. Also worth noting uh, these options down here next to the minimap, you have a strategic view which basically turns the game into a sort of a 2D version and just gives you icons. Sometimes it can be useful if there's a lot going on, if you want to find something very specific. Uh, but the map options are worth having a look at. Um, recommendations is just sometimes if you select a certain unit, such as a worker or a settler, it will come up and show you what tile it recommends building on. You can hide that. Resource icons. Normally, these are off by default, and I always recommend turning them on because it basically gives you these little icons that show you where all of your resources are. When you get used to the game, you can just tell by looking at them what they are, but it's nice to have. Yield icons will actually show you how much food, construction, and gold you'll get from each individual tile, but it does look very cluttered, so that's normally off. Hex grid on or off. It does look better with it off, but when it's on, it makes it much easier to work out how far away something is. Brilliant if you've got ranged units. And trade routes to be shown, but we don't have any at the moment. So let's get out of that. We're going to start production at our first city. So we've got six production per turn. Now there's only one building we can build, which is a monument. Um, but one of the first things we want to build is a scout. It's the quickest unit we can build. It has a movement of two, pretty much like our warrior does. It's not as strong fighting, but the advantage of a scout is it doesn't actually get a terrain penalty. So it can move through forests and jungles and it doesn't cost it any additional movement. Now we're going to have a look at our research and there are a variety of things that we can start with. There's a massive technology tree. If you've never seen the technology tree for Civ 5 with Brave New World, it starts with agriculture, which everybody um, sort of has by default. And then it branches out into sort of four different directions. And these branches converge and split as you go through the tree. And you go quite the way through from medieval, um, renaissance era, industrial, modern, atomic information. So you can see there's quite a lot of um, stuff to be learned there. As you can see, some of these higher techs say it's going to take almost 3,000 turns. That isn't true, of course because the game can only last 500 turns, but as you build your cities and get more population, you will gain more research or more science, which means these will take less time. It's quite possible to click something further up in the tree, and it will automatically path out and tell you uh, which order to do it in, uh, depending on which of these you want first. I'm going to go for Animal Husbandry, because that gives us um, the ability to get horses, which are a strategic resource. And also leads on to things like trapping, horseback riding and the wheel. But we also need archery for the wheel as well. So some of these things, if they've got two lines going into them, you need to research both things first before you can get them. So we're going for animal husbandry. And that now appears in this little thing up here in the left-hand corner. It's telling us it's going to take 11 turns for that to be resolved. Uh, we can click this button here in the corner. And that gives us the option to look at our research panel, our unit list, cities, resources, and great people. Not something we need to do at the moment. If I click on the name bar above my city, uh, you can see the wonders and things I have in the city. So for wonders, we start with the palace. The palace is always automatically built in your capital city. If your capital city ever gets captured, you will um, it will mo automatically move to a, another city, and that will become your capital. The palace will always provide you with three gold, three science, and three production. So basically, even if you haven't got any people working the land, you will still get some very basic input coming from the palace. Now, city management. This is one of the things that a lot of people um, don't even realize is here. You only have a limited number of... Um, citizens uh, or population within your city and it requires the population to be able to work these particular tiles so as you can see at the moment uh, we've got a green head here which means that there is a citizen working this tile 
I could click here and tell the citizen to work that tile. Now the reason that becomes uh, a padlock is because I've selected that tile manually, which means it will stay locked. Um, what you can do is you can say focus on food, focus on production, focus on gold or science and the computer will automatically move that person to the appropriate um, sort of appropriate hex to work on. Now at the moment I've got an unemployed citizen. An unemployed citizen will provide you with one construction per turn. Um, the problem is an unemployed citizen also uses the same amount of food as someone who is working. So this guy is, produ is producing one construction but using one food. If I put him here, he will be producing one construction and producing two food. So it's a better way of doing it. Most people leave this on default. There's very few times when you actually need to move people around manually. Let the AI do it for you. But remember, if you do want a quick boost on production, or if you want a quick boost on science, or gold, or faith, or whatever, you can actually just select it from here, from the citizen management. So, I'll cover that more as we go through. So, I'm going to get out of there. I'm going to get started by selecting my warriors who have a movement of two, although they're only going to be able to move kind of one hex at a time at the moment because they're stuck in trees. And trees uh, have, uh, well, forests and jungles have a movement penalty. So it costs two movement to move uh, through a jungle or forest. Um, but you only need one movement to actually be able to move into it. So that's not too bad. Um, but we're going to have to move around very slowly until we get our scout. Let's hit next turn and start to see what happens. So what you will often find is that the very uh, early turns are quite boring. There's usually not an awful lot that happens because nobody's found each other and there's nothing going on. So I'm just going to keep moving my warriors around. Having a scout around the immediate area, hopefully we will find um, some ancient ruins because ancient ruins give you an early boost, an early bonus. Hopefully we won't run into too many barbarian camps. Now we've got a lot of dyes around us which is potentially useful. So we're trying to uncover the uh, fog of war. So anything that's under clouds is an area that we haven't visited before which means we can't see it. We've got absolutely no idea what is in these areas. Anything that's in shadow is fog of war, which means we've uncovered the ground there, but we can't see if there are any units in that area. And then anything that is highlighted means we can see. Most units can see for um, two hexes around them. You can always see every hex within your borders, and you can see the hex that is uh, next to your borders as well. And like I said, most units have a sight of two, which means they can see two hexes, but you can't see over trees or uh, you can't see over jungles, you can't see over rainforests unless you are on a hill. So we're going to keep those guys moving around. Now, we have uh, the production button has now popped back up. This is because we've now finished our scout. So what we're going to do quickly is go right ahead and build a monument because that will get us some early culture. Culture plays a very important part in Brave New World because we could use that to head towards a culture victory. Uh, it also allows us to expand, uh, expand our borders more rapidly. So the more culture you have, the more you can expand your borders. So let's go for that. We can now found uh, a Pantheon. And this is part of the religion system. So once you hit a certain amount of religion, you get to choose one of these things and each one of these is unique and can only be chosen once by any player so if i pick fertility rights for example the next person to gain enough faith to be able to choose a uh, pantheon won't be able to pick it i actually like fertility rights 10 percent faster growth rate which means that my um, cities will grow much faster so let's keep moving these guys around uh, I think I've already moved them on this turn. Oh, it's saying a unit needs orders because we've got our scout. Now, what I'm going to do with the scout is click this button here and put them on Explore Automated. And they will go off and I won't really have to keep my eye on them. They'll just run around and do their own thing. Let's head to the next turn. They've got over there, not found anything particularly exciting. Now, if I take my warriors here and move them here, this is a hill. Now, when you're on the top of a hill, you can actually see over um, tree tiles. So that means they can actually see two tiles across. 
Rivers also use all of your movement. If you cross a river, no matter how many movement points you have, crossing a river will use all of them. Unless you have a road going over the river, or a railroad, and you have um, engineering, and then you can go over them without it using all of your movement. So let's keep these guys moving. Again, they're moving into trees, so it's going to use all of their movement. And this is often one of the problems you get early game, is you do tend to spend the first few turns just constantly clicking the button. Okay, so we found the Baringa Crater. This is one of the natural world wonders. And as you can see, by discovering it, it actually increases the happiness in the Empire. Output if worked, two gold and three science. Well, it's apple. not something that we can... Oh, okay. So a few things happened on that turn. Uh, it's not something that we can actually... Uh, work at the moment. There it is. It's on that tile there. We can't work it because it's not within our borders. Now it also looks like our scouts found a um, ancient ruins on that turn and ran straight into it, which it said gave us a technology. Well, that's why all of a sudden, if we just go into the uh, technology tree, we now have archery. Uh, it, it did pop up and I, I clicked it closed so I could show you what I wanted to show you, but that's automatically research the archery for us which is absolutely great um so we're going to carry on moving these guys across try and uncover as much of the ground as possible click next turn so the best thing to do is let your scouts do the exploring because they don't have the um movement penalties your scouts can quite happily go through um trees um looks like we found another ancient ruins there as well so we could be getting another bonus you can use your warriors to explore, but it's highly recommended that you keep them close by just in case you run into barbarians because you are going to need them if that happens. So let's click on the next turn. So we've they obviously found and explored those ruins. Cultural artifacts, uh, which all your citizens, you have received 20 culture, which is nice. Now that should give us enough culture to adapt a social policy. Okay, so what are social policies about? Well, some of these policies are locked until you get to a, a specific era, such as the classical era, medieval era, uh, renaissance era, and so on. And ideologies you can't uh, do yet until you reach a certain era or uh, build three factories. So what do we do? Well, these give different kind of um, boosts and boons to your city. Tradition is um, very good for rapidly growing small cities so if you've only got one or two cities but you want them to grow really quickly tradition is good liberty is very good if you want to expand your empire by founding new cities honor is very good if you're building a standing army um piety is very good if you want to increase your faith and so on and so forth what i'm going to do at the moment is i'm going to adopt tradition because i've only got a single city and i want to grow that as quickly as possible um Building this will increase my border expansion. It will give me an extra three culture in the capital city and allow me to unlock the hanging gardens. And if I unlock, if uh, I adopt all the policies within this tree, it'll give me an extra 15% uh, food growth and a free aqueduct in my first four cities, which is fantastic and allows me to purchase great engineers with faith starting in the industrial era. So it's really, really worth getting these. This is also um, part of the way that you can win a cultural victory as well. Uh, in the vanilla sif 5 and in gods and kings the way to win a cultural victory was you had to completely max out five of these um social policy trees when you'd maxed out five trees which meant you would got 25 social policies you could then build the utopia project and the first person to build the utopia project basically won a cultural victory in Brave New World, that's actually now changed. It's nothing to do with the amount of social policies you have. It's about the amount of tourism. Um, you have this. This is a new thing for Brave New World tourism, and these both work for your uh, cultural victory. Your culture is almost your defensive ability to protect your city from other people's culture, and your tourism is your offensive ability, your ability to spread your culture to other civilizations. Very, very hard to get a cultural victory early on in the game because tourism is very, very difficult until you research certain technologies later on. So let's keep these guys scouting around, and then that should be the end of that turn there. Now we've researched animal husbandry, but that is because that is what we were researching anyway. 
so it allows us to build caravans to make trade routes now trade routes are something that were added in brave new world they allow you to connect your own cities to each other and ship food and construction between cities they also allow you to connect with other civilizations and city states to trade um, gold and resources and it also allows us to build things such as pastures for cows and sheep and reveals horses on the map which are used to build powerful mounted units so you can now see on the top bar here we have this horse that's appeared now there's a zero next to it because we have no horses anything that appears along this top bar is a strategic resource a strategic resource is used to uh, build certain units and in some cases to build certain buildings and whenever you get to a certain technology that lets you see a strategic resource they'll appear on the map here so you've got things like horses um, iron coal oil uranium aluminium i think they're the strategic all the strategic resources and you might see that there's none on the map but as soon as like these horses weren't there before but as soon as you actually have the ability to um utilize these strategic resources they'll start to appear on the map so they may well even appear within your own borders anything that isn't a strategic resource such as dyes and furs and sheep um these are a uh, luxury resource and the uh, way a luxury resource works is it actually gives you happiness but you only gain happiness for the first one of each type so here i've got two dies i gain happiness for the dies but for having two lots of dies i don't gain any additional happiness which means i could trade one of these dies with another civilization for a, a luxury resource that i don't have and get additional um happiness from that so that's something i'll cover as we get to it we've now built our um shrine we could start to build the Temple of Artemis, but it's quite a way off. So I think what we're going to do now is um, try and churn out an early worker. Now you keep seeing on some of these units and some of these buildings, these little things appearing next to them. And you have four advisors in this game. Um, you basically have, I can't even remember what they all are now. You've got the science advisor, the economic advisor, the military advisor, and what is basically your sort of foreign affairs advisor. And every now and then they'll give their suggestions of what you should build well both my economic advisor and my science advisor are saying i should build a worker which is what i'm going to do anyway i don't always pay attention to what they tell me but most of the time it's worth it so what do i do here what is a useful thing to have well i've got a lot of furs around well i've got some furs around so the best thing for me probably to do is um trapping and that will allow me to um build us i uh, can't build a circus because i don't have any horses or ivory nearby um but it does lead to horseback riding we will get this eventually um, mining allows us to construct mines and chop down forests well i don't have anything in my borders to mine and i don't want to chop down these forests at the moment because these forests are providing me with a lot of extra faith for my civilization bonus so what i'm going to do I'm going to go for pottery because that leads to the granary and the granary essentially allows me to increase food production in the city. Unit needs orders which is these guys here. I'm not going to take them too far away. I'm just going to scout this area around here and then keep them close by to my city just in case those filthy barbarians attack. So yeah they haven't found anything just take them down here to this uh, this stone mine. Nope still haven't found anything particularly useful yet. Just quickly explain what these things mean on the city bar. Uh, this number at the top is the city combat strength, which is essentially how um, each city has 20 hit points, essentially, and they can be attacked by the uni uh, units and whittled down. The city's combat strength is basically how much damage the city can do when, uh, when it fires back, when it bombards uh, an enemy that's attacking. The number on the far left hand side indicates the city size, its population size. So my population size is 2. And as you can see here, there's a little green progress bar with a number next to it, which says that in 7 turns, my city will grow from size 2 to size 3. The star represents that this is my capital city. This little lightning bolt represents that I have a pantheon, but no religion. And this little icon on the left hand side is what I'm producing, which is the icon for a worker, and that's going to be nine turns. So that tells you everything you need to know at a quick glance on that bar just there. So let's click on to the next turn. 
Okay, we've met Florence. Florence is a city-state. We're the first empire they've met, so they give us 30 gold, which is always nice. Um, they are cultured, which means that if we uh, become their friend, um, they will increase our culture, essentially. They will give us more culture. Um, their personality is irrational, um, so they can be a little bit random. And they also have horses and silver. So if we become their ally, we will actually get their horses, which could be particularly useful. We can find them on the map. They're right up here at the top, which means that our um, scouts must have ran into them. Yes, they have. There they are. So that's our first city-state discovered. I'm going to keep moving these guys across just to see what they can find here. Okay, we found another natural wonder, um, which is Mount Kailash. And again, that gives us some more happiness. If we can work that... It will actually give us faith and happiness within our borders, but unfortunately, it's quite a distance away, so we don't have another city near that at the moment. So we are going to leave it there for the end of this video, because I've covered quite a lot. I appreciate that most of this video has just been me going through basics, but mastering the basics is one of the ways to master the game, and there's quite a lot to this game. It is a very, very in-depth game. Hopefully, on the next episode, I'm going to be able to get a bit more in depth in the turns and we'll actually start seeing some barbarians and there'll be a bit of action going on but like I said my style has always been that of tutorials I do like to try and teach people games and grand strategies are a passion of mine and this is one that really does need a lot of time and effort put into it so if you have stuck with me until the end of the video guys thanks a lot I hope you're enjoying it um, I'm going to keep going with this because I'm going to play through the game anyway and I'll record it as I go whether or not I upload the rest of the videos is all dependent on how much you guys enjoy enjoy and whether or not you want to see the rest but thanks for watching and i'll see you next time goodbye for now